You have things like Khan Academy, which are very popular, but extraordinarily wrong-minded. I mean, it's really, if you had to design the worst of all possible outcomes, you design Khan Academy. Oh, please. It's really extraordinary. Well, please explain. First of all, let's, let's pretend for a moment that learning, and I'll even use education, can be divided into two parts. What I'll call instructionism, what I sort of tell you, and constructionism, what you're able to make and design and so on. So let's say that those two parts can be separated. And all we want to look at is instructionism, if you will, the art of explanation. It can be a person, it can be a book, and so on. So that's clearly the thread of Khan Academy. It's not right. writing program. So the, go down that thread. Let's say that's the thread. We're not going to argue with that premise. But then you look at, you know, the execution, and there are three glaring, unbelievable, mistakes. One is Khan Academy thinks they're going to write everything. Hello? I mean, we have Wikipedia, we have crowdsourcing, we have experts. So you're going to be... That was pretty mm -hmm. strange. Um, number two, the belief that you can become just acquainted with a subject and then do a lecture. So you'll do a program on chilly after the Allende government because you read a book on that. There are people who spent lifetimes on that. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, you know, the, the, the doing it themselves, being amateurs on lots of the subjects, and then confusing, quite dramatically, minimalism in sort of a graphic sense with low production values. So you've got low production value, amateurish content done by one group. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how wrong can you go in, in the instructionist thread, which isn't even my favorite one, I think. Yeah, right. We should spend our time in constructionism. So I've talked to Saul about this, and he showed me some things that were more constructionist, but they're going down this path, and everybody's sitting there and saying, isn't this terrific? Well, it's actually quite an opportunity loss and opportunity cost because it's kind of sucking the air out of the room. Right. And when you go to higher education like the MOOCs do, mm -hmm. um, I think Coursera and Udacity are unfortunate, to be honest with you, because there is something about being a non-profit versus a profit. But you can't criticize them because it's at a point in education where you could arguably say you don't want to have brain surgery from somebody who's just tinkered with brains. I mean, there really is a body of knowledge, right. and you want to impart it. And, you know, they, so that's more like a library, and at that sort of high school and university, that makes a lot more sense. Very early age, which isn't Khan Academy, but you go to the very early stuff, um, it's more about playing with ideas and striving to have kids who go through this system, whatever the system may be, and come out passionate about learning. Really passionate about learning. Sort of get an appetite and a thirst that is, you know, unquenchable. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the target of early learning, and that's what we were trying to do with One Laptop Per Child. I mean, that's, this is like one of the hot topics, right? You know, MOOCs and that, you know, it's, uh, the nature of higher education and mm -hmm. institutions like MIT mm -hmm. is are going to change. I'd love to, you know, hear where you're thinking well, to pose on that. It, whatever your thoughts may be on the subject of MOOCs, it depends whether you think your role is teaching. And at MIT, I can tell you with all honesty, it's not teaching. Um, and it shouldn't be about teaching. You look at MIT as a place to invent and discover 
and to push the boundaries of knowledge. And the students are on, they're lucky to be here on that journey. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to a place, and I'll pick Princeton, metaphorically, you actually go there to be taught. Now, yes, there are things happening, and there are some graduate students, and there's the Institute for Advanced Studies, and so on, but it's literally and certainly metaphorically more about teaching, whereas MIT is about research. So, if you're a university whose purpose in life is to teach, mm -hmm then MOOCs are a nail in the coffin. I mean, you they're going to be so good, the quality is going to be so high, the interactive nature of them will get better and better and better, the peer-to-peer -peer discussion side will get better. They really, So they have no place to go but up in the sort of transmission of knowledge business. If you're trying to discover and invent and it's, whether it's in biotech or computers or whatever, um, that's, in my opinion, the role of the university. Mm -hmm. So I, from where I sit, they don't really overlap at all. MIT, when it started, you know, MITx, which became edX, I was a little disappointed because we were suddenly celebrating what we really don't do, and. People were telling me, yes, but it will allow us not to do it. And I said, well, I shouldn't be doing it in the first place, but that's okay. But then when it became edX and Harvard and others, I thought, that's perfect, that's fine. So I have no trouble with MOOCs, and I think it will force a lot of universities to rethink their purpose. And the kind of places that will not be displaced at the moment, without any good, are art schools, design schools, where you have to go and it's so experiential and it's so much being in the studio and making things and talking about what you make. So you don't hear any architecture department sitting around and worrying about whether it's going to disappear because of MOOCs. But you do hear, you know, the physics department if these teaching undergraduate physics and then passing a test at the end, right. they're at risk. Yeah. Do, do, you, do, you, uh, do you see a day coming when you can just get that higher education by completely doing the... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 